Hello and welcome to the 25th Vermont Grazing and Livestock Conference. I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. I would like to thank the National Grazing Lands Coalition, Food Animal Concerns Trust, Morrison's Custom Feeds, Rural Vermont, and the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. I would also like to thank our partners. I would like to thank the United States Department of Agriculture, National Institute of Food and Agriculture, and the National Resources Conservation Service. I would also like to thank Cedar Tree Foundation, and the Forest C. and Francis H. Latner Foundation. Thank you for joining us for the 25th Grazing and Livestock Conference. The conference is brought to you by the University of Vermont Extension Center for Sustainable Agriculture and the Vermont Grass Farmers Association. Enjoy the content. Okay, that's great. Am I a little tiny patch up in the corner? Yes, yes. Good, that's where I belong. Okay, <clears throat> so. Um, thank you all for inviting me, actually, to do this talk. I'm honored to be here. Uh, and so I have, um, you know, a background as a, a teacher at UNH and a sheep farmer for about 20 years. The sheep farming really is my big credential, despite my education. And so I learned a lot about coyotes, <clears throat> trying to keep them off of my sheep. And I will be talking about that more a little bit later. <clears throat> I am a New Hampshire and Vermont representative for Project Coyote. Uh, they are a national organization that promotes coexistence. And I wanna make sure that I, I really give them a shout out because their website, you can see below projectcoyote.org has great information for the farming community um, that will reinforce what I'm going to say today. So if you haven't already joined Project Coyote or you don't wanna join, but you wanna just hop on their website and take advantage of their educational materials, please do so. So my big plan for today is we'll look at what exactly this coyote is that we have here that we're living with. It is unique in the entire of the United States in terms of the kind of coyote that we have. Um, the United States is the only place that that has coyotes, although it's kin in the form of uh, jackals and other wild dogs are found all around the world. So we'll look at what the Eastern Coyote is, go over some basic ecology, talk about uh, successful farming with coyotes, and then end with a little note of, of uh, conservation, if that sounds good to folks. So to start off, how does our coyote differ from the Western coyote? The, our coyote is mostly Western coyote. Uh, the Western coyote can be regarded as a kind of an ancestor, um, but you can see some important differences. Some of them are uh, physiologic. For example, it's the Western coyote is a much lighter animal, 25 to 30 pounds generally. Our Eastern coyote is anywhere from 35 up to 62 pounds. And by the way, the largest coyote ever documented only weighed 62 pounds. There are no Eastern coyotes that weigh 70 or 80 or even 90 pounds, which you know I hear frequently, gosh, I saw this coyote, it, I, it weighed 90 pounds. Um, out West, uh, they call it the brush wolf, the prairie wolf or the American jackal. Uh, here we call it the Eastern coyote or coyote. Um, some people use the term coy wolf. I don't prefer that term. Coy dog is not cool anymore. So if you, if someone reminds me, I will talk about that later. Out West, and this is a behavioral difference. Out West, Western coyotes affiliate in loose packs. Out here, we normally see them as singletons, but those singletons are usually part of a family pack. And the fact that our coyotes out here mostly congregate in a, in a pack situation is a true behavioral shift. Um, in terms of the colors that they can come in, everything from white to black. 
The same is true out west as is here. And both of these animals are omnivores, scavengers, although our eastern coyotes, being larger, can take deer. If we look at just their skull difference, you can see on the left, the smaller size of the western coyote skull. I would point you especially to the occipital crest over here. Compare that to the eastern coyote, how much larger dimensionally this animal is. And you all may be aware that the muscles that operate jaws attach up here to this occipital crest. So, you know, this animal here is capable of uh, taking down uh, larger beasts. In fact, the first incidents ever documented, documented last two years ago up in Southern Canada was of a pack of Eastern coyotes taking down a two-year-old moose. So let's move ahead. Our coyote, um, our coyotes down here in the left-hand corner, our coyote is made up of about 60% Western coyote. And down in the bottom right-hand corner, anywhere from two to 30% Eastern wolf. That is the wolf that's found in, generally found in Algonquin Provincial Park, but elsewhere as well. The Eastern wolf has, is a, a kind of a red wolf. So that there's still debate as to whether the Eastern wolf is a red wolf. Um, but anyway, they're very closely related. And up here we have the gray wolf or timber wolf. And there is a dose of timber wolf in the Western coyote. So when, when we arrive at the Eastern coyote, we have an amalgamation, a true hybrid creature of Western coyote, Eastern wolf, perhaps a dab of gray wolf, and some coyotes have dog in them as well. There are many advantages to being a hybrid. And one of them is versatility. And if there is a versatile animal, it is surely the coyote. Um, when the coyote began to migrate from the Western states eastward, they migrated here because the predator population had been greatly reduced and because massive deforestation had occurred, opening up the land for farming. Um, and it also opened up the land for a, a new kind of predator. Coyotes weren't really resident here prior to about 1940. Um, this does not mean that they are an invasive species. An invasive species is something else can, um, altogether. So the green arrows represent the coyote that would eventually settle here in the Northeast. The black arrows represent the coyote that moved across the central and Southern states. The green arrows represent the coyote that hybridized with the Eastern wolf when it came across in the early 1920s. So that when the coyote settled in New England, it carried the genetic material from the Eastern wolf. These coyotes down here did not have an opportunity to interbreed with a wolf because they had been eradicated until, until about 20 years ago, when the US uh, Fish and Wildlife Service attempted to reintroduce the red wolf here into North and South Carolina. What we know about the red wolf is that it loves to breed with coyotes. So as the red wolf population expanded out from the coast uh, into the inland, it met up with the coyotes that had made their way across. And now those coyotes and red wolves have been hybridizing. As a result, the red wolf is vanishing. And some of those coyotes in the southeastern states are becoming more invigorated with wolf genes. Very, very interesting. So as the coyote moved across the northern part of the United States, little western wily coyote meets this very handsome eastern red wolf type and becomes this larger, more capable predator that we have living with us today. In its most majestic form, 
the Eastern Coyote can look like this. This is a picture of an Eastern Coyote from Nova Scotia that bears a fair amount of wolf genetic material. And if any of you ever go up to Algonquin Park, you will notice that the wolves in the park have a very coyote-ish look. And then outside the park, you'll notice that the coyotes outside the park have a very wolfish look because there's still hybridization that's going on. So the coyote, basic coyote ecology in terms of time of the year and what they're doing right now is mating season for coyotes. Very exciting time. And I'll show you why in the next slide, but basically January to March is when they breed. It's a 63 day gestation, just like any dog. Um, if coyotes that are breeding now will give birth at the end of March or in early April. Coyotes that breed at the end of March will have their pups in June. Um, at, right before she dens, the, the female will select the den site, uh, spruce it up a little bit for maybe the year before, then settle in to give birth. They're in the den six to eight weeks until those pups are ready for action and adventure. And then May to August, the pups are in a rendezvous spot on territory. And those pups are the ones that get in trouble because they're naive to us. And the ones that survive that uh, may become dispersers uh, October to December. They are sexually mature at one to two years. Two years is preferable, uh, but they can become sexually mature a year early if there's a lot of disruption to their pack. The first sign of breeding is bloody urine in the snow. I hope you all have not eaten lunch yet. So um, I, we saw this just last week out in the back here. I, I'm in Webster, New Hampshire, uh, but the same thing is happening in your fields and, and forests where you are in Vermont. Um, the females that are in breeding condition, uh, they'll you'll see their they're tr the traces of them in the snow. And so here's the deal. Um, females have a one week estrus in the entire year, which is such an enviable thing from my mammalian perspective. So a one week estrus, uh, and it is only during that time that she can become impregnated. The males have sperm that's not really viable, which is another great idea, by the way, those, the sperm is not viable until breeding season. And the, the smell of female hormones help the male become um, enriched with a lot of viable sperm. Um, I'm gonna show you what, what you'll see following a bloody urine. And that is a pair of coyote tracks moving through the woods. Frequently they'll hip bump each other. Um, you might see them being you might see the tracks that they're very playful. It's really kind of a joyous thing to walk through the woods and see that and know that they're having one week of a hell of a good time. Um, so uh, because they breed January to March only, they don't waste much time. Um, so the male, male and female could join. Now, it's important to understand that because our coyotes tend to pack up a pack is formed when a male and female find one another, mate, and their offspring become the beginning of a pack. So a pack is nothing more than a family unit. Uh, it, it will also, it's also important to understand that if your farm is in the territory of a pack of coyotes, um, it will be the dominant male and female in that pack, mom and dad, they are the only ones that breed in that pack. And as long as the female stays around and stays alive, she will stop her young daughters from breeding. And so she is the one, the, the alpha female, she is the one that provides stability to the pack. And so when coyotes are hunted during their breeding season or hunted at any time really, and it's nonspecific kind of hunting, if the dominant female is taken, it's going to disrupt the pack. 
and it will ultimately lead to more coyotes. More on that later. So male and female find one another. Uh, 63 days later, give birth to a litter of pups. Um, the pups are born deaf and blind like all dogs. Keep in mind coyotes are dogs, wolves are dogs, jackals are dogs, are all members of the Canada family. Um, and so they stay in the den. That den is defended, defended, defended against us, against our dogs. When we get too near a den, we could be confronted with a, a pretty scary looking coyote who will chase us back off of that den area. Um, and it usually doesn't, doesn't uh, end up being harmful, but you know, dogs can be wounded uh, if they're off leash and they happen to stumble upon a den. So at about seven weeks, the pups are moving around outside the den. Um, by eight weeks, they're the cutest little things in the world. They make terrible pets, but they're adorable. And when they're out of the den, they still depend on adults who are hunting taking food in, partially digesting the food. And then when they are begged and encouraged by a cute little pup licking their nose or pulling at their, their lips, they will regurgitate their food. Um, and by that means the pup learns what its natural food is. The key for me was I did not want those pups to learn that their natural food was lamb. So I'll talk to you about that in a little bit. By the time the adults are ready to move the pups, the pups are given no notice about this. They're just picked up one way or another and moved out of the den, away from the den and to a safe spot on territory. The den is then not used for the rest of the year. So simply finding a coyote den at any other time of the year other than basically between the end of March and the end of June. If you find a den, then back off. But any other time of the year, that den is not in use by coyotes. It could be used by porcupines or any, any other kind of creature. And even once they're away from the den, um, the, the parents, as I said, continue to care for the pups. Eastern coyotes self-regulate. If we leave them alone, Ironically, if we leave them alone, we would have fewer coyotes on the landscape. And we know that the heavier they're hunted, the faster they reproduce. This is no longer a debatable thing. And New Hampshire and Vermont fishing game agencies understand this. So they regulate by four mechanisms, territoriality, having a territory and defending it, having a pack life, being monogamous, remember what monogamy means, just one partner, and um, a limited heat. So I've already talked about their heat being very limited, which really confines them to a one week per year opportunity to breed. And um, so let's look at this in terms of territory. What is a territory? A territory is an area that contains all the food, the water, the den sites and the cover that a single pack of coyotes needs in order to survive indefinitely. Therefore, what we know about territory is that the size of the territory depends upon the prey base. This is super important. We know that coyotes main diet consists of rodents as well as every other thing. They are omnivores and scavengers. They will eat anything. But if perchance humans provide coyotes with an additional source of food, say for example, livestock or uh, any kind of li livestock, or um, if you're feeding deer, which is a bad idea, they'll eat corn. Any kind of food that they can get into their stomach will supplement them enhance their nutrition, the females will then have, the female will have larger litter because her nutrition has been enhanced. So it's interesting to look at coyote ecology and how once you understand how they work, 
it's, it's very informative to us in terms of how we conduct our lives. They are monogamous, they mate for life. Their life in the wild on average is four years, but coyotes kept in captivity can live 16. But living out there in the wild is rough. Cars, hunting, trapping, all of that kind of thing. Um, monogamy and being territorial can reinforce one another and both limit population. How else do they do they um, exhibit their territoriality? They defend it by marking. So here's a coyote that has come to a bait station, uh, which was set up to study coyotes, not to kill them. And they have glands on their, all over their faces and in their paws and all over their bodies. And by rolling, they essentially mark that site as theirs. They are marking it so that coyotes from other packs should understand that this area is not theirs. They also proclaim their territoriality by howling. So this actually is about a four month old pup that kept coming in front of my trail cam and howling for its pack members. Um, so, you know, when a pack is howling, um, a pack can be announcing its might and its strength when all of the members of the pack are howling. Um, and most of the time though, howling is just a form of social communication. It doesn't have anything to do with beginning a hunt or ending a hunt. It is to communicate and gather the gang, not in the same way that wolves do, um, but gather the gang. Poop is also another way of marking territory, both urine and poop. And I, sh I wanted to show you this poop because it's so beautiful. You can see shards of bone in it and hair of at least a couple of different critters. You can learn a lot by studying coyote poop. Last thing you wanna see in it is sheep fur um, or wool. So the, another regulatory mechanism is pack life. So as I said before, here's mom and dad. They might have come from two very disparate parts of Vermont and met up right at the female's estrus, mated, and last year produced a litter of pups here of which only three survive. You can see down here, the pups have a very high mortality rate. They're naive to people. They get into trouble. They don't understand cars. They don't know how to cross a road. Um, they eat stuff they shouldn't eat and get poisoned. They run into porcupines, for example, as do, as do many uh, adult coyotes. And with a mouthful of porcupine quill, um, that is a slow death by starvation. Anyway, the mortality rate is high. So in this pack, there's mom and dad. Maybe there's a disperser from another pack. It's very unusual. There's last year's yearlings, which will help to raise this year's pups. So um, the this is, a, I think, a pretty useful slide that, sh that this is a, a study that was done down in Rhode Island. Um, the researcher put a GPS collar on the alpha male and female during the time that the pups had been moved from the, the den to the rendezvous site. The adults were moving around the territory looking for prey to feed those pups. And by use of the collar, you can see how on territory these coyotes remained. Their territory is basically outlined by these blue um, signal spots. So they rely on their territory to provide them for the food that they need to feed the mouths that need to be fed. That is a good reason why the daughters will not be allowed to breed on territory because there simply would not be enough food to feed the mom's pups plus her daughter's pups. Okay, so here's, here's the part where I get to talk about um, my sheep herding. These, this, these are not my sheep and that is not, a, this is a joke. Um, I moved to New Hampshire with some sheep 
Uh, I didn't intend to ever have sheep, but somebody gave me a border collie, um, this border collie to be precise, because he was ripping apart their home. I got him some sheep. He settled down. He became a great, great sheep dog, but I wanted more sheep. So I moved up to New Hampshire and I bought a farm that it had a lot of coyote predation. Uh, there was no barn. There were terrible fences. I understood why the guy had coyote predation. And I thought, if I can educate the local pack of coyotes to not hunt my sheep, um, then this will be a very interesting experiment. So we put up a small barn. Here's the barn in the diagram. We put the kennel behind the barn. We had a corral out here, which we would bring the sheep into every single night of the year, no matter how beautiful the night. And we had pasture land out here as well. So um, of course, border collies do not protect sheep. They simply herd them. And so it was my responsibility to figure out, um, to think like a coyote basically, and try to um, presume that I knew in advance, seasonally, what the coyotes were going to be doing. And because I had studied wolves for 10 years prior, um, I had a pretty good idea. So um, we brought the sheep in. Uh, when it was lambing time, the, they used to drop their lamb, lambs in the barn. I waited until the lambs were pretty sturdy to even let them out in the pasture. And then I made sure that there was a good human presence in the pasture. Uh, I had four foot stock fence. I had no electric wiring. I used no lethal controls at all. I just managed intensively. Um, when anything came up next to the barn, the dogs would bark and I would come roaring out with some kind of thing like an air horn, which my neighbors didn't appreciate too much. And uh, twice a day, I would take my dogs for a walk around the farm and they would mark the territory in the way that dogs do. The first winter, the coyotes would come out of the woods and they would pee or poop right where my dogs had. Everything was working perfectly. Then came their breeding season. I knew they'd be pretty busy defending the den, so not a problem for me. But when those pups came out of the den and the adults began hunting for, the, for food for the pups, that's when I knew that I needed to be most on my guard. And since I knew that on average coyotes live four years, I thought, okay, for four years, I can be a maniac. I can do this for four years and use all sorts of hazing and flattery, which, you know, putting stuff on the fences, putting chairs outside the fence line, doing all sorts of stuff to keep coyotes wary. And if I saw coyotes, I would chase them. Some of the coyotes we would see would be small ones like this, but very gray, um, very nice wolfy color really, but a very small coyote. Um, and uh, we saw coyotes that were also pretty red, indicating that that red wolf line might be part of the ancestry of the coyotes that uh, whose territory I was in. You can also see, let me go back, look at his ears. Look at how pointed and coyote-like these ears are, but how square his little muzzle is. And then if you look at this coyote, you can see she has a much more pointed, narrow muzzle like Western coyotes, but the ears are spaced very differently and a little bit more rounded. It's interesting how these wolf and red wolf and Eastern wolf and Western coyote traits pop up. Many of the coyotes that we see look pretty much like this guy. Pretty good looking fellow looking at me on the other side of the fence, which is exactly where I wanted him. So um, what we also did when we, when we got this farm is we pushed the tree line way back. And I think that that also is an important tip. Uh, don't have your, uh, your fence right up next to the woods. That's just an open invitation. And we had to keep that mode. So in terms of management, um, the barn at night, I checked my fences every day. I was around my, my kids who were small, but kind of big for small, were around 
our dogs were around, um, all of these things. And of course, I was aware of coyote seasonal behavior. And I knew when the time was that I had to be most on my guard. Most of all, it just takes the willingness to coexist. And that I have found in the 30 years that I have been doing this, giving talks and doing research, I have found oftentimes a willingness, but frequently an unwillingness on, on people's part to simply fence their backyard to keep their kids safe or you know, do fencing for livestock, even cows that um, you know, have always wandered around through the woods and that kind of thing. Coyotes aren't gonna bother a mature cow by and large, but calves, they could go after a calf. Why take the chance? You know, protect that little guy. So for me, all of the work paid off because in four years, I never lost a sheep or a lamb. And these were coyote coyotes that had a good taste for sheep. Um, and then, you know, I had my farm for about 20 years and I never lost a sheep. So after four years, though, we had a pretty good, more relaxed relationship. And I'm going to give a shout out to my friend, Dave Kennard, who makes the best fencing in the entire world. Um, coyote deterrence, good fences, tight and checked. And then um, the other thing that uh, that friends of mine with some coyote concerns ended up doing was having series of smaller fields so that they could keep a closer eye on what was going on. One device that you can make at home are coyote rollers. And this is just, you can see here, it's PVC um, sort of looped on the top of fencing If uh, to actually buy coyote rollers. They can be pretty costly. But down here, you can also see that you can go to um, swap shops or yard sales and pick up as many rolling pins as you can, drill holes in these, and then string them up on the top of fencing. And coyotes who, who are attempting to jump up on those fences can't get a purchase. That's an option. Guard dogs work great. Even the farmers out west that have huge expanses of cattle and sheep farms rely more and more on uh, different kinds of guard dogs with very good success. Um, I know many people who are using mules and donkeys. Uh, it's a much cheaper way to go than, than buying a guard dog. Um, and for some reason, mules and donkeys don't seem to have much affinity for dogs of any sort. So that's a possibility. And llamas. Um, I know many people who swear by llamas. They swear at them too, but they swear by them. And it's a good non-lethal alternative to reduce predation. I did most of my research in New Hampshire up in Coas County. Um, and my camp was right next to this farm, a thousand acres or so owned by George Hodge. And um, I went over and asked him if I could put trail cams up around his farm. And he said, sure. We got to talking about, does he have problems with coyotes? And he referred to them as the dogs, D-A-W-G-S. And he said, no, no problems with the dogs at all. And I said, what do you do with your dead cows? And he said, I just throw them in the woods, let the dogs clean them up. I thought, oh my God, here is such an opportunity. For one reason or another, the, the boneyard, which is right over here, just right in the woods there, is, is so close to his, to, his, um, to his cows. And yet, according to George, he had never lost a calf to a coyote. He had lost one to a bear, um, found the bear. That was the end of that bear. Um, you can see I'm setting up uh, my trail cam here and I'm looking at some of the bones from the boneyard. You can see the two trees and the two trees here with a couple of coyotes that visit this area frequently. So what was George's secret? His secret was so simple. 
he had fences. He used some electric fence, as you can see down here in the bottom. Uh, the electric fence, by the way, works really well. Coyotes can easily jump over it or, or in this case, crawl under it. But they didn't have to. They were very well-fed coyotes on the carcasses. They also had much alternative prey up there because the ecosystem is largely intact. And George did a very simple thing. Um, as soon as his cows were going to drop their, their calves, he brought them up to the barn where it was a, a tight enclosure right next to the barn where there was a lot of activity. He has a couple of large dogs that roam the, the farm, never lost, never lost an animal. So let's look at the things that coyotes do eat. This is stuff that from their scat, you can see that this is mostly rodents, some fruit and berries, some bunnies and fawn. Fawn make up about 30% of coyotes diet in the spring. Overall, deer make up about 18% over the course of the year. Much of that deer is scavenged, but I'm here to tell you that coyotes will take deer. Um, insects, weasels, gophers or woodchuck, fish, or even catfish. I, I can't hear you laughing, but I hope you're laughing. Um, aluminum foil, uh, more rodents, some amphibians and cats, uh, frogs. Um, I've picked out uh, bits of ked in coyote scat. They're really not picky, as well as some banana peel. What's missing from this is the human face. They are not interested in us. We are not on their, their diet at all. And even when coyotes have approached me rather closely, I know I knew that they weren't approaching me because they were intending to eat me. They were curious about me. So keep that in mind. Um, coyotes do climb up into apple trees. And these pictures are from Indiana. This was taken in January. If you will recall, what is the breeding season of coyotes? January to March. This picture was taken in January. What are these apples loaded with? Alcohol, party time. So this is probably a mated pair, male and female. And she is cruising around in the tree looking for these really fun kind of fruit to eat. You know, I've never seen drunk coyotes anywhere, but I can only imagine. So to keep livestock safe, education, 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 know about the predator. The more you know, the more power you have. Recognize and accept the need to intensively manage. It's, it's, an, it's an easy thing to do. And remember, you know how easily trainable dogs are. Coyotes are easily trainable. You just have to put the work in. Um, so you can read this, lambs in the corral, all of the things that I've talked to you about. And then um, we have found that putting a neighborhood watch program in place is also really helpful. Unfortunately, there are many people in their love for coyotes don't behave well around them. For example, they, they leave food out for them. That's a really bad idea because of course you might love to have coyotes in your backyard and you can get great pictures of them up close and personal. Your neighbor next door is completely freaked out when coyotes appear in their backyard or um, climb up on their deck and look in the windows at them because they have been habituated. So the last thing we want to do is habituate coyotes. When I see a coyote anywhere nearby, um, my first response is to run at them. Never run from them, of course, but run at them. Wave your arms, be loud. Um, if you're young and fit enough, chase them until they no longer are looking back to see if you're chasing them. Hazing does work. But a neighborhood watch program uh, will, will just mean that, you know, if, if one of you sees a coyote or two out in the field, hunting mice, let people know you've seen coyotes out in the field, they're hunting mice, they're well-behaved coyotes. If you just say, I just saw two coyotes in my field, it could be alarming. 
but if the neighborhood watch program is a useful, helpful thing to help people coexist, um, you know, fill, fill folks in. Finally, um, you know, the, the public has become amazingly more aware of where their food comes from, how food is raised, how food is killed, and are um, much more likely to purchase food locally, uh, to visit farms, to look at your operation. I think that there's every incentive in the world for the animals that we eat to be raised humanely, sustainably. Um, and and uh, certainly I would promote the idea of living, of you, you know, living as sustainably and coexistently with the nature that surrounds you. In my, in my experience, farmers have done that. The people that I know love wild nature, um, but not everybody. And the U.S. Department of Agriculture, of course, and Wildlife Services uh, don't usually promote coexistence. They usually have lethal methods that they that they promote. So um, I I see that it is one o'clock here, and that I have 15 more minutes with you. I'm I'm sorry for racing through this so quickly, but I wanted to end early so I could answer questions. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Chris. Sure. Um, we do have some questions for you, and. Um, and some praises as well happening on oh good chat and questions so thank you so much you're welcome um, i'm going to read off a question just straight for you um because i think it's the best way to get it across yeah um after seven years of only seeing coyotes cross our fields two times we had a couple traveling through our fields and right up next to our house a few times about three weeks ago, for ab about a duration of three weeks. What, what might cause them to suddenly decide to explore so close? We have three dogs, male and female, that patrol the farm, but are inside overnight. Hmm. So uh, does, I, I, is there any way that I can actually talk to this person or, I mean, I need, uh, I feel like I need a little bit more information. Okay. Um, so, you know, I wonder what would have drawn them to get so near the house. That's kind of in my in my world, that's really exciting. And I would love that. But the other thing is this, the, the winter time is a great time if if the person has the time to look at, you know, follow coyote tracks and look at where their territory extends. If their house is is within that territory, and I suspect all of you, the people listening, their farms are within the territory of a pack of coyotes. That, coy that coyote territory should be defended. So what it may be it are animals that are dispersing from somewhere else yeah. and are not following the usual protocol that the pack that they normally live with are following. Yeah. Without more information, it's really hard for me to tell, but I'll use this as an opportunity to say I make house calls. So um, even though I live in New Hampshire, I'll come over to Vermont gladly and take a look around and see if we can solve that mystery. Oh, that's very exciting. <laughs> I know it's exciting for me. <laughs> All right. Um, so we have another question about um, how applicable this is to wolves. We have um, someone watching whose farm in Italy doesn't have coyotes, but does have wolves. Oh. Um, so could you help us understand any connections that could be made between the two? Well, there's a lot of connections to be made. I know about those Italian wolves. Um, capiche, right? <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, with, with wolves, uh, I think the same protocols would work, especially the use of guard dogs. And I know that in, um, you know, using guard dogs is an ancient, 
ancient device to keep livestock that are roaming around in unfenced areas to keep those livestock safe. So I don't know if the person from Italy uses guard dogs or not. Um, we'll get you in. We'll get you in touch with them. So okay, but good. it's good to hear how um, how the coyote wolf um, behavior that you were speaking of, the coyote behavior that you've been speaking of can help us understand wolves as well. Definitely. They have the same breeding season. They have the same estrus, length of estrus, all that stuff. All right. So we got some clarification on the coyotes that were coming up to the house um, for about three weeks after never really showing up. It looks like um, this farmer has rabbits, chickens, and barn cats, all of which are free range at some point during the day. Oh. Um, could those smaller animals be attracting? With the note that they're not new, they've been running around for the last two years, but would they newly be attracting? Yes, absolutely. And, and you know, I'm, I am so all for free range everything. You know, if I couldn't free range myself in the world, I would become a mental case. But we have to realize that those super vulnerable little guys, um, you know, if they're not if they're not protected in their free rangeiness, they're going to be the prey of anything: hawks, owls, coyotes. Yes. All right. Um, so there's some discussion happening with the question, is it crazy to try sheep farming with no guard animals? I think you've yeah. spoken a little to it here, but I just wanted to give you another opportunity. I, I just think, um, you know, if the investment that you would make in a livestock guard dog is substantial. And so um, if, if cost is an issue, I would say get a mule. You know, go to the SPCA and adopt a mule. They need a good home. Um, it's just such an easy way to a get your, you know, well, it, it's an it's a very easy solution, and it takes a lot of pressure off the farmer, because when the farmer can't always be in that field, then you've got something out there doing that work. It uh, does this person fence? I wonder. Right. And um, and um, can you speak a little bit to, um, this is my question coming in, <laughs> a little bit to the different things you did in your four years of training these coyotes. Um, you spoke to, about um, chairs outside fence lines and things. Um, you just were changing the environment. Is that my understanding? Isn't that crazy? I mean, yes, I was I was changing things up so that, um, you know, at night they come around, they check out what the situation is and they'll do that for a few nights, maybe a week. And when they've got things figured out, uh, then, then if they're going to decide to move in at night or, or even in the middle of the day, they can do that, but you put something out there that's different and it throws them off. Okay. Uh, they're extremely sensitive to that. But in that four years of, of mania, um, I, I would um, frequently sleep in the pasture right next to the barn. And as soon as my dog, which I had in my tent with me, became aware of something, I'd go charging out of that out of my tent with my trusty air horn or a gong or something to be just terrifying to coyotes. It, you know, I wanted to be a surprise to them. And so it, I caught them off guard a lot and, and I was much younger and I could chase them for a long period of time. And so it wasn't worth their while. All right. So the next question, um, are fox and coyote on the same farm a positive thing? What does that tell you about the environment or the ecosystem happening? And um, what benefits do, would a farmer see? So of course, both of them are rodent patrol, right? So that, that to me was the single greatest thing about having coyotes out there. But the presence of fox, um, coyotes are actually pushing fox closer to people 
because if a coyote can catch a fox, the coyote will kill that fox. Ne not necessarily eat it, but possibly eat it. Um, and and so, so, you know, even in urban situations, foxes are appearing all the time now. So I always think that it's great to have carnivores out there working on our behalf. Um, usually if you see fox out in the field, usually that means that coyotes aren't around close by because foxes are hyper aware of being preyed upon by coyotes. So I would say the more the more of them, the better, but, but foxes can really give you a sense of where coyote, coyotes are relative to, to the farm. All right. Um, why don't the coyotes take down more deer when they're so abundant? Because they're really hard to get. Okay. So um, we, the, you know, um, a couple of weeks ago, we had 25 inches of snow and that snow was up to my border collies backs and they're about the size of a coyote. And so, you know, my dogs were really struggling. I have to think the coyotes were struggling as well. Then we got three inches of rain and then it all became ice. So the deer had the advantage in the deep snow because they can bound. On the, in, when, the, when the forest land turned to ice, now the coyotes have the advantage. So it shifts depending upon the environment. And once those fawn are old enough to not be laying down in a field, um, and they're, you know, they've really, uh, they're, they're on the way. They're much harder for coyotes to get. And people ask me too, why are there so dang many turkeys? You know, aren't coyotes taking turkeys? They would if they could, but female turkeys with those spurs on the, on their, on their front legs make absolute ferocious defenders of little poults. So, um, you know, deer by and large are pretty hard for coyotes to get. Coyotes benefit from the hunting season because unfortunately not every hunter is a great shot. And so when a deer is wounded, um, coyotes will, will know that right away and will that, you know, the deer, the hunter comes back the next morning, there's nothing left of the deer usually. All right. We've got um, a participant out there talking about listening um, on their 200 acre farm in Northern Vermont, listening to the coyotes, um, mm -hmm. sometimes just a single one, sometimes a whole pack. Yeah. Um, what, is there anything we can learn from what they're saying? Oh, I think so. The little four month old coyote that was howling in front of my trail cam was howling. I wish I had the ability to record that little guy back in the day, but it was the most mournful, where the heck are you? Where the heck are you? And then I would hear an adult, clearly an adult with larger vocal cords sounding much different than a little yipper that's squeaky sounding. You know, I would hear the adult saying, we're over here, we're over here. And then sometimes, from my camp, I could hear two different packs howling. One pack of four or five animals that of course sounds like 15 because they can throw their voices. One pack howling here, another pack howling over there. That is territorial defense. So people who don't understand coyotes think, Oh my God, there's a pack of 20 coyotes out there. I'm doomed. We've got to bring in the Navy SEALs and, you know, get rid of these coyotes. Um, no, it's just coyotes being territorial. All right. So just like we had a question about fox. Oh, wait a minute. I, I want to say something else too. Um, <laughs> when wolves, wolves will howl before they hunt. And I've seen this in Yellowstone where a, the dominant pair start howling, they bring in the pack and then they go hunting silently, of course. The reason that they need to bring in the pack is because what they eat is so darn big. It takes the pack to take down the animal. Coyotes, the reason that 
when we hear coyotes howling, it has nothing to do with getting ready for a hunt. It's because what they eat are rodents. So it doesn't take more than one coyote to take down a, a mouse. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so if I'm out there um, using some of these um, prevention techniques for a coyote, um, how is that going to apply to the bears that I might have around? Not at all. Okay. Oh yeah. Are I mean, they bear... going to be deterred at all? Well, bears don't like electricity. Okay. And so if I, you know, I, and they also don't like dogs. And that's another good reason to use dogs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in New England, uh, we hunt bear with dogs. Um, and, and well, here in New, in New Hampshire, we do. I don't know if Vermont being a whole lot more progressive than New Hampshire, um, I don't know if you allow that over there but it really has trained bear to greatly fear dogs, mm -hmm. even border collies. All right. Well, um, is there anything else you'd like to speak to today? We've got just a couple minutes left. Oh my God. Um, I would say that, and I'm not really a woo-woo kind of person. My, my training is in science and I rely on the science part of my head when I'm teaching and, and doing this work. But I have to say that, that some of the moments in my life that I will never forget are moments when I have been confronted by a coyote and um, I remember one night riding my bike down a hill and I was just screaming down this hill and it was near dusk and a, and a big coyote went right across the road about 50 or 60 feet in front of me. And I thought, oh my God, it's so beautiful. I want to get near this animal. It was stupid of me, but I laid down my bike maybe 15 feet from this coyote and I got down on the ground and I began to like a pup, because there's not a coyote in the world that can ignore the sound of a pup. And it stopped the coyote and he turned around and looked over his shoulder, you know, the way coyotes do. And his ears were up and his head was tilted and he was trying to understand what this person was or what this thing was. And, um, and then he sort of got a look of disgust on his face and wandered off. But it's magical to me to have this top predator in the woods once again. Um, it's new to us. It requires different kind of behavior, but it's so necessary for the health of our ecosystem. And so, I don't know. I mean, I've always been a carnivore advocate because they're so critical to healthy ecosystems. Um, and I'm so pleased that that your group asked me to give a talk. I'm so pleased. And I would encourage everybody really to go to Project Coyote's website, projectcoyote.org and learn as much as you can about sustainable farming or, or farming with carnivores. Yeah. yeah. And um, so how do we get in touch with you if we're interested in an on oh, okay. farm, uh, look at what coyotes we have around? Sure. So my email is nh, as in New Hampshire, nhcoyotes at gmail. All right. And I'm putting that in our chat right now. And that's going to finish it up um, for us, nhcoyotes at gmail.com. That's it. All right. Um, so that is in the Zoom chat. Amber will put that up on the Whova chat for you all to see. And um, thank you so much for joining us with this presentation. It was great fun. Thank you. It's, it's just been a, really a pleasure, a very fun um, uh, delve into coyotes for me. So thank you. Thank um, you. Up next, me. we have our keynote conversations with Nicole Masters. Um, so we will see you all again at 1.30. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.